Uh, on behalf of the Business and Finance Society, thank you all for coming. Well, it would be an incredible understatement, as we all know, to say that we're in uh, trying economic times right now. Uh, what some of you might find peculiar is that the price of oil, as we recover from the worst economic downturn uh, since the Great Depression, is uh, flirting with $90 a barrel. That's almost four times its price following the last recession in 2002. Here to explain to you why that is and what it could mean for our future is James Howard Kunstler. Now, I first heard Mr. Kunstler speak several years ago uh, on national public radio while driving home from work uh, in suburban Long Island. And during the course of the program, he carefully explained how that car and those suburbs could someday cease to function and what Americans could do to prepare themselves for a future without oil. Reading his book, The Long Emergency, made it clear that Mr. Kunstler was an authority on the subject and that he was willing to speak frankly about an issue that many in government and the mainstream media were more comfortable to ignore. He has appeared on NPR, the TED Lecture Series, and the Colbert Report, and has contributed regularly to the New York Times and Rolling Stone magazine. His most recent novel, World Made by Hand, paints a colorful portrait of what life could be like for millions of unemployed former Wall Streeters and suburbanites who might very well end up being the Dust Bowl migrants of the 21st century. Ladies and gentlemen, please just join me in welcoming James Howard Kunstler. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thank, thank, hello, young lawyers. We have a lot of ground to cover. There are going to be several parts of this uh, spiel, um, and not just oil. Uh, but I want to really comprehensively describe the predicament that we're in and, and also suggest to you that what we can do about it. Uh, and some modes of, uh, of thinking that are not just, um, uh, you know, so-called solutions to our problems, but whole new f frameworks for understanding what we're doing and how we might respond to it. The, the most striking uh, part of this whole problem probably is that, uh, uh, is our failure to construct a coherent consensus about what's happening to us and what we're going to do about it. This is a period of striking confusion. Um, and I want to I start talking to you about the, the economic distress that we're in and, and give you some ideas about where, you know, what might be behind it and where, what is happening and where it's going. Now, there are arguments actually against uh, the idea that the peak oil story is responsible for our financial problem. Um, personally, I think it had something to do with it, and I'm going to describe it as follows, that one of the main implications of the peak oil story, and we're going to talk about oil a little bit later, um, is that we're not going to ha enjoy the kind of regular cyclical economic growth associated with industrial productivity that we've been used to for a long, long time that has been the basis of finance as we know it in the terms of investment instruments as we understand them, producing profits and, and uh, growth, so-called, in a certain way. That the, the whole um, failure to increase energy inputs into our economic system will have this comprehensive effect. And without, without increased energy inputs, we're not going to have that kind of economic growth. We're going to kind of hit a wall. Um, and one way of representing this wall is, is to understand that when the price of oil gets over $75 a barrel, we enter a zone of trouble with the economy, where the economy starts to respond but the symptoms aren't that terrible. But then you get over the $85 range and you really start to get into some danger and destruction of activity. Um, without growth, the, this whole system that we have elaborated over the last roughly 150 years, but especially the last 100 years, is not going to be able to continue. And largely because without continual growth, we can't repay debt when you're living in a revolving debt economy. Uh, as a 
result of all this, the U.S. is broke at all levels. We're broke at the household level, we're broke at the corporate enterprise level, and we're broke at all levels of the government, municipal, county, and state, and federal. And um, I think this is what, sort of how it happened, is that as we come out of the uh, 1980s, um, there is an apprehension on Wall Street that you cannot make really good money the way that they were used to making it in the conventional investment securities of stocks and bonds and debentures and all that stuff. And um, we start to, uh, and, and it coincides with the con computer revolution. Uh, one consequence of that is that a lot of kids in science, in places like MIT especially, where they also have a big business school, right? They've got a lot of science and they've got a lot of business. The, 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 the math jockeys uh, start to, the math jockeys start to get interested in using math to make money on Wall Street in securities and in cooking up new kinds of securities with math to do it. And you begin to get the first kinds of um, uh, abstruse, incomprehensible financial instruments that easily lend themselves to defrauding other people. And uh, in fact, it wasn't until last week, really, that, that we've gone through about two years of a financial crisis. It wasn't really until last week when the SEC filed formal actions against uh, Goldman Sachs, that the two really useful words started to bubble up out of the morass of misunderstanding. And the two important words are swindle and fraud. And that's what a lot of these financial instruments represented. They, uh, you also have to understand that they were, they were devised because there was this belief that we could no longer generate regular cyclical profits out of conventional instruments based on industrial production of things of value. So these new securities, these new innovative securities, the mortgage-backed securities, the collateralized debt obligations made of MBS, the um, uh, credit default swaps, and all of the other Frankenstein securities were uh, engineered to get something for nothing, which is a very different kind of economy from one that's based on productive activity. And of course, that because it's not really possible to get something for nothing in the real world, these things failed rather quickly. And a, a further consequence of all that is we now have no ability to generate further credit. And um, um, without, without generating constant credit, we're not able to operate in a revolving debt economy. Uh, moreover, a lot of the banks, the, you know, all of the big banks, all of the big, too big to fail banks are now stuck with a great deal of the bad paper that they generated themselves and they're choking on it. They've hidden it away in their vaults, but basically it's worthless and, and it makes them, it renders them insolvent. So we have a zombie banking industry now, a sector, that's not really capable of, of really lending uh, in the, the conventional sense. It's been abetted by uh, an enormous amount of accounting fraud, which in itself has been sanctioned by the authorities, by the government, uh, and by all of the regulating agencies. And this comes in the form of things like the Repo 105 uh, um, uh, dodge that, uh, all of the banks have used one way or another, but which Lehman most infamously used to conceal uh, its true uh, uh, financial condition by temporarily offloading its bad debts um, and non-performing loans uh, on other institutions or companies at the very moment that they had to report their condition on the, in the quarterly reports. And then they would get them back and put them back in their vaults because they, they uh, I'm sorry, this thing is, has a mind of its own. Um, so th that was the Repo 105 thing, and that allowed uh, uh, Lehman, most notably, to uh, pretend that it was a solvent bank until the last moment when it finally fell apart because its um, uh, misdeeds were so egregious, so much more than the other banks. 
um, the Financial Accounting Standards Board's Rule 157 infamously um, uh, invoked last spring, which allowed banks to, pr to pretend that the bad securities that they had in their vaults ha could be valued at their face value, when in fact they had lost uh, a great deal of their value, some of them almost all of their value. Um, the extend and pretend, and pretend mortgage racket, which has now become almost uniform throughout the banking system, not only among the big banks, but especially the regional banks. And this is what is behind right now the um, fiasco in residential and commercial real estate in the various localities. And the banks uh, and the extended pretend racket essentially means that the banks are not calling in their bad loans. They're letting people stay in houses that they're not paying their mortgages on for years, you know? For years, you can, you can not pay your mortgage for 18 months and never get a phone call or a letter from your bank because the bank does not want to acknowledge that the loan has gone bad and they don't want it to be on their books, so they, they do that. And that, in turn, is being abetted by uh, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, and so that's, that's a huge part of the story right now because it's going to come to an end. People cannot stay in houses that they don't have any financial interest in at all forever. Yeah, I mean, sooner or later, you're going to run into things like title problems. You know, maybe not right away, but sooner or later. It's a question of, really, what is property? And as lawyers, you know, you ought to appreciate that the basis, really, of, of our legal system is really what is property and under what terms uh, is it possessed and transferred. So that's destroying uh, some of the basis of contract law in America. Isn't that wonderful? The bailouts we know about, I don't have to elaborate on. And the interest rate carry trade, which has also allowed the too big to fail banks to pretend that they're solvent by um, borrowing money at nearly 0% from the Federal Reserve and turning around and buying US Treasury bonds at 4%. OK? I mean, what kind of a racket is that? Certainly not fair to anybody else doing business in America. So the upshot of this is that the revolving credit economy may be gone forever, as we've known it. And it, the upshot may be that if you're in business from now on in America, you better do it on the basis of accounts receivable, or you're not going to be in business anymore, you know, or, or pretty close to that. I'm not saying there's going to be any lending at all, but it's going to be much reduced from what has been normal for us for a long, long time. Uh, without this kind of lavish credit, of course, the middle class as we have grown to know it is going to cease to exist, is in the process now of evaporating, and that leads to social problems, which we'll see about later. Finally, um, the, the, the final problem with this credit crisis is that a huge amount of wealth, of capital, of, of money is flying out of the system into a black hole from which it will never emerge again. It will never be seen again. And this was the money that we hoped we would have to invest in the next economy, whatever that is. Supposedly, let's say, the post-oil economy. The money that we'd hoped would be there for the things that we had intended to do, whatever alternative energy things and schemes that we had, that that money is now gone. We don't have it anymore. So it's going to make it even more difficult for us to negotiate this uh, transition that we're heading into. These people are laughing because we told them that, that our treasuries were good, were good investments. And this is now the unfortunate condition of the United States. You know, after a good half century run of, of preeminence in the world, and not just preeminence in industrial, you know, dominance, but even preeminence in things like the rectitude of doing business in a nation of laws, in a nation where people could depend on uh, their property rights being fairly adjudicated. So this is a very big deal that we're going through this. Okay, the second thing, the, the part two, America's oil problem. Well, the first part of the problem, I, I, I've already... Uh, uh, stated one of the big dangerous implications that um, we can't grow an industrial economy the way we had been used to. And this is apart from the fact that we've outsourced and offshored so much of our industry in the first place. It's not even there anymore. 
But we have this additional problem with um, energy resources, and the energy crisis is not over. It's just been temporarily sort of foreshadowed, shoved off stage a little bit by the capital uh, crisis. And by the way, I want to mention one thing. You know, uh, people use the word capitalism, I think, uh, kind of promiscuously. And I'm, I don't think of capitalism as a belief system. You know, it's not, it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. Capitalism is a set of laws governing the behavior of surplus wealth. And compound interest worked just as well for the Soviets as it does for, for people in the West. You know, so forget about thinking of capitalism as a, an ideology. It's not really an ideology. It's about what happens, how you acquire surplus wealth, and how you deploy it once you've gotten it. And what you do with it. Okay. The old oil theory, you know, was that in the Hubbard's peak idea, you know, you, you come to a peak in global production and then it falls steadily off and, and it's a, a long slope downward. Uh, what we're realizing, though, you know, those of us who are paying attention to the oil situation, there are a lot of things going on in the oil scene that the public is just sort of clu not, they're clueless to. Uh, now, that first peak on the... Um, uh, on your left is the American oil peak. We produced more oil than, than we ever will again uh, in 1970. And from there, we went down. We produced 10 million barrels a day then. Now we produce about five. And we compensated for our, the losses in domestic production by um, importing oil from other countries. The problem is, is when the globe, when the world peaks in oil, we're not going to be able to borrow money from other planets. Uh, excuse me, borrow oil from other planets, import oil from other planets. So the possibility is that that slope is going to be a lot steeper and darker than we've thought it, it was. There are a lot of screwy ideas out there now, and uh, a lot of delusional thinking. One of them is this, this idea that the Earth has a creamy nougat center of oil. You know, I have a special folder for these ideas that I call complete fucking nonsense. <laughs> and this is one of the ideas that I put in that. And so we'll hear more about this, you know, uh, from, I get letters from cranks every week about this, but um, it's just not true. Uh, there are now uh, uh, several things that are, that are converging on us to uh, mutually reinforce and aggravate the problems that we have and make them all worse at the same time. And many of these problems are within the oil folder, okay, that the, that the, the public is unaware of. First of all, <clears throat> we're simply not discovering significant amounts of oil. And in fact, we ha there hasn't been a year since 1980 when we uh, found more oil in a given year than we used. And the, the divergence has been greater and greater every year since then, so that we're finding relatively insignificant amounts of oil compared to what we're using. And of course, you know, the other nations in the world are now catching up with us in things like car use and, and, and buying cars and stuff. We need to find the equivalent of a new Saudi Arabia every year just to, to offset the depletions that are going to be occurring in the, the decade ahead. This gives you an idea of what the depletion profile is for, for an oil region that saved America's ass in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. You know, Alaska came along, along with the North Sea and Siberia, to take the leverage away from OPEC. But notice that uh, Alaska is now reaching a very low point in its arc of depletion. Same thing's true of the North Sea, same thing's true of Siberia. The oil export crisis, poorly understood by the public. What it basically means is that the nations that send oil to us are using more and more of their own oil and able to send less and less of their oil to us. At the same time, they're undergoing depletion. So they're producing less oil, they're using more of their own oil, and they're able to send less oil to people like us. You know, this, their populations are growing. Places like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela subsidize, Iran subsidize their gasoline so it's incredibly cheap, you know, 30 cents a gallon or something. The companion to the export problem is oil nationalism, which, you know, whenever we get into a crisis with oil, um, whenever we get into a crisis with oil, uh, the public uh, gets up in arms and starts uh, shaking their fists at the oil companies. 
right? You know, Exxon Mobil is, is um, punishing us to, to make money. But the fact of the matter is over 90% of the oil in the world is produced by the national uh, oil companies like Aramco in Saudi Arabia and Petrobras in Brazil and uh, Pemex in Mexico. And for all practical purposes, the Russian oil companies. Um, and they are using, uh, they are using their oil uh, for geopolitical leverage. And they are making favored customer contracts with special people they like, and, and they are uh, punishing their adversaries, and they're going to do this more and more. And that is the new reality of the oil market. What, one offshoot of that is that less and less oil is going to be sold on the futures markets where, where bidders bid for it in an auction process, and more and more oil is going to just be uh, sent around the world in, in favored customer contracts. Oops. Um, there's, a, there's a wish out there along with the other, a lot of other delusional ideas that the tar sands are going to offset our, the depletions that occur everywhere in the world. Not likely. They are not likely to ever produce more than 3 million barrels a day. The United States uses around 19 or 20 million barrels a day now. And the Canadians use a, quite a bit of oil themselves, so that ain't going to happen. An interesting... Uh, rub here. The, uh, you know, we often hear uh, the phrase new technology uh, bandied about a lot. And the idea is uh, we've got all these new techniques for goosing the oil out of the rock. And uh, in fact, something, something else actually happens. The diminishing returns of technology comes into play. And uh, the North Sea is the poster child for this. Um, the North Sea was one of the last great oil discoveries, and because of that, they used the latest and greatest techniques to get the oil out, and it only had the effect of depleting the North Sea more efficiently, so that England went from a, uh, a, a net exporter in 1999 to being a net importer in 2005, and, and you can see that their production profile is going down very, very steeply. Mexico is the poster child for America's import problem because uh, Mexico is our number three supplier of imported oil. And uh, they, they, you know, for geological reasons, they depend for most of their oil, more than half of their oil, from the Cantorell oil field, a single supergiant field, the second largest ever found in the history of the industry uh, in the world. And it's to, it was also found in the early 70s and got into production in the 80s, and they used all these new techniques to exploit it. They used horizontal drilling and pumping nitrogen and seawater into the rock to get the oil out, and it only had the effect of uh, depleting it more efficiently so that it's now, uh, the depletion rate is around 15% a year, and their export rates are going down even more steeply. Shale gas, probably way overhyped. Um, you know, people are now saying, the, 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 the gas companies themselves are saying, you know, that, that shale gas is going to save uh, happy motoring in America. Very unlikely. Um, the wells deplete much more quickly than the conventional gas wells, and they, uh, we have to use, in fact, the, the production of it is so toxic that it requires the injection of, of a lot of water loaded with chemicals into the rock to fracture the rock. And um, it's been outlawed in New York State. Um, another problem with the oil industry that the public is, does not appreciate, most of the infrastructure for it is decrepit. It's 40, 50 years old, and this includes the pipelines, the drilling rigs, the tank farms, um, the refineries, it's all old, and it would require something like a trillion dollars in investment to bring it up to speed, and nobody in the oil industry, either the state-owned companies or the private companies, want to make that investment because they know they're in a twilight industry. So unlikely to happen there. Okay, that's, that's the oil story. Climate change. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk about this much today. And uh, uh, personally, I think that we, we, have, we, we are faced with pretty severe challenges in, in climate. But, um, uh, you know, there, there are new things even this month. There are new... Um, factors in the, in the mix, including the Icelandic volcanoes. 
And um, all I can say about it is that the problems we have with climate are probably going to ramify and aggravate whatever problems we have with capital and with energy resources in that whole um, nexus or, or equation. So I called this whole bundle of problems the long emergency and wrote a book about it under that title. And the, you know what, what it suggests is that we're coming into a, a transitional age that's going to be a very dif difficult. It's going to be an, an age of discontinuities or breaks from things that are familiar from us. Practices, habits, customs, ways of doing business, uh, social uh, uh, values, all kinds of things. And it's going to be a, a, a difficult time for us. Um, often when I do a university lecture, um, somebody gets up at the end and says, you haven't said anything about population. You know, obviously, a huge problem at the bottom of this story, you know, is, is population overshoot. You know, we've overshot the carrying capacity of a planet, you know, with the, uh, especially one that's run, run in an industrial way. But um, the fact is that, uh, you know, there's nothing to say about it because we're not going to do a damn thing about it. There's not going to be any protocol. There's not going to be any policy, at least not in the USA. You know, so really the usual suspects are going to come in. They're going to do their thing. You know, starvation, lack of food, um, compromised immune systems, disease, violence, war, conflict, etc. The whole peak oil story has never been about um, running out of oil, particularly. I mean, it is about depletion and having less and less every year, but it's really not so much about running out of oil so much as what happens to the complex systems we depend on as this occurs. And the problem is that these complex systems break down. And these are the systems we depend on for daily life. And they can be described with precision. The way we produce our food, industrial farming, farming based on a lot of petroleum and natural gas byproducts being tossed onto the soil and a lot of diesel fuel being used to work it all and move it around. And that's how we do food. Well, guess what? We're going to get in trouble with petroleum-based agriculture. We already are. But we're going to get in a lot more trouble fairly soon. And it's going to be a huge problem. Another system we depend on, commerce, you know, trade, selling things, making things and selling them. Well, um, uh, the way we've evolved is that we do, do it with Walmart and Target and chain stores. And uh, we're, that equation is coming to an end. Most Americans don't know that. They think that Walmart is a permanent institution, but it's not. The way we do transportation, you know, I call it happy motoring. Um, that's been our way of doing it in America for a long, long time. We're probably done with that. America doesn't know it yet. You know, America still thinks that we're going to rev, rev up the whole car thing again and keep it going. That's one of the reasons we're making such massive new investments in highways. And um, I got into this whole set of issues by writing a couple of books about the fiasco of suburbia. <coughs> and... Um, I do think that a lot of the uh, the problems are, you know, are behind that are behind this uh, um, come from our problems problems with suburbia. Um, suburbia really um, uh, has poor prospects for the future, and w what we've done is we've poured our uh, post-war World War II wealth into this infrastructure for daily life that has poor prospects for the future because we're not going to have the fuel to run it the way it's been designed to run. And this has provoked, in turn, a, a problem with the psychology of previous investment, meaning that we have uh, put so much of our national wealth into this system for daily life and even invested our identities in it that we can't imagine letting go of it or, or substantially reforming it. And so we're, we're kind of stuck with it. Um, what's more, um, uh, unfortunately, w something happened in the, in the 1980s, 90s, and uh, early 21st century in the process of offshoring all of our industry and getting rid of uh, American uh, manufacturing. We sort of slid into this new economy, which was not the new economy we, we told ourselves we had. You know, we told ourselves that we had a service economy, we had a, uh, a digital information economy, 
et cetera, you know, a post-industrial economy, economy. But that was all bullshit. What we really had was a suburban sprawl building economy. That was what the housing bubble was all about. And that's what the commercial real estate fiasco is all about, the overbuilding of the furnishings and accessories of suburbia. And um, uh, unfortunately, what it represented was a whole economy that it was now uh, directed towards producing more of an infrastructure for daily life with no future. A very tragic thing, right? I mean, what could be more tragic to pour your national wealth into something that has no future? And I think we're done. I think the project of suburbia is over. We don't know that yet either. But we're done. We're, we're not going to be doing much more of this. You know, people see this stuff being built out there, but when you do see it, you know, if you do happen to stray over into the Poconos or, you know, go out to the Midwest or something, and you see new things being built, remember, these things received their approvals 36 months ago. Okay? But we're done. We're done. And what's happening right now is the guys who bring you all this, you know, the production home builders and the appraisers and the realtors, they're all kicking back thinking, oh, well, we'll just, you know, we're going to try to just manfully wait out the bottom. And when the bottom comes in, you know, then we'll see it tick up again and we'll resume our practices and habits that we're familiar with, right? You know, we'll start building more suburban homes again and more strip malls and blah, blah, blah. We're done. That ain't going to happen. They wait in vain for this to resume. Uh, you know, anybody who, who is looking at this can see very clearly that, that one of the things we're going to have to do is get, get a different kind of mental revaluation of what un- uh, developed rural land is for, because we're going to have to grow more of our food close to home. The industrial petro-agriculture system is not going to survive in its present form. We're going to have to grow more, more food closer to where we live. It's probably going to require more human attention. We have no idea how this is going to work out. Um, but what it does mean is that we have to consider that our undeveloped land is no longer, its, it's highest and best use is no longer strip malls and suburban houses. Uh, there's understandably a wish to keep all of our stuff running because of the psychology of previous investment. Um, but what it has been generating really lately is a lot of delusional thinking about what's possible. And I, I think the bottom line is this, and the key to understanding where we're at right now is this, is, you know, we're going to do all kinds of alternative stuff, all kind of all kinds of alternative energy and systems for running it, but we're going to be disappointed about what these things can do for us. That's the key to understanding it. We are not going to run Walt Disney World, the interstate highway system, and Las Vegas, and uh, Walmart, and the U.S. Army on any combination of alternative fuels. So we got to get real about this. And I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not against alternative fuels. Okay, or alternative systems, but we're, we're going to be disappointed by what these things can do. Uh, and, and probably it's going to work out differently than we imagine. Um, for example, we're probably not going to do very many giant Godzilla-sized wind farms. And for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is we're now faced with the problem of having a lot less capital than we used to have. So the capital is not going to be there to even do this kind of stuff. But we're probably going to do this stuff on a smaller, more modest scale, the community scale, the household scale. Don't expect to do it on the regional scale as much as people are blabbing about right now. Um, and in fact, a key, I think, to understanding where we're going is that we have to relocalize and downscale virtually everything we do in order to succeed. Uh, this was the old school version of this idea that um, the American way of life is non-negotiable. And, and of course, if you don't, if you don't negotiate the stuff that the, university, the, that the universe sends to you, you get assigned a new negotiating partner named reality. And then it negotiates for you. You don't even have to be in the room. You can go do internet porn while, while ne uh, reality negotiates your fate. This is also obviously a very childish idea. You know, one of the differences between, uh, you know, being a child and being an adult is, is uh, knowing that you have to participate in, in your own destiny. Uh, I, was, I voted for Mr. Obama, but unfortunately, you know, our 
basic national attitude about this has not changed that much. You know, it, now we're just, we're not apologizing for our way of life. I don't know whether we're negotiating it or not, but, but we're not really getting too clear about it. And, you know, w one of the, the impediments to thinking about this that's behind all of this is the now widespread belief in America that, that when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. This used to be a, an appropriate idea for babies and for, you know, seven-year-olds in America. It's now normal for all Americans. And that's not a good thing be, because a major difference between being a grown-up and being a baby is knowing the difference between wishing for stuff and making stuff happen. Uh, the companion idea to this is uh, the idea that it's possible to get something for nothing. And this is um, uh, represented by um, um, America's, the holy shrine to America's newest religion here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And, and America's newest favorite religion is not evangelical Christianity, though sometimes it might seem that way. The favorite new religion is the worship of unearned riches. And it's exactly why Goldman Sachs has been doing, and, and everybody else on Wall Street has been doing what they're doing for the last 10 years, because this has now become universally believed that it's okay to get something for nothing in America, all right? And, and so you combine those two ideas, you know, that when you wish upon a star, you'll get something for nothing, and you get a pretty comprehensive picture of what the American mentality is right now. It's a very dangerous set of beliefs, and it's not going to help us out. Um, Another delusional belief back there in the whole corpus of, of them is the idea that technology and energy are uh, uh, substitutable, that they're the same, and that if you run out of one, you can just uh, plug in the other one. No more energy, plug in technology. It's a complete misunderstanding of, of how the universe really works. And um, I gave a talk at Google uh, about three years ago and uh, I saw a, a really dreadful illustration of this. It was appalling. Um, I gave a talk in their new auditorium in their Mountain View Silicon Valley office building. You know, and, and this was a, an, you know, a suburban office park building that was tricked out like a kindergarten. That, you know, they had uh, um, uh, the lucite boxes full of gummy bears and knock hockey games and ping pong tables and video consoles. And um, clearly, you know, th this, this uh, sort of plays into the idea that the more childlike you are in American corporate life, the more successful you'll be because you'll be more creative. You'll be more like a child, right? So that sort of makes an impression on me when I just go in the joint. And then the senior executives and engineers come into the auditorium. And they're dressed like skateboard rats. <laughs> they're like wearing sideways hats. Their ass crack is showing. <laughs> These are like, you know, million dollar executives. So I, I give the talk about energy. At the time, it was all about oil. And at the end, they did comments. There were no questions. And they all had the same comment, which was like, dude, we've got technology. Okay, subtext, you're an asshole. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it clued me in as to what's going on, which is that um, yeah, at the highest level of American high-tech corporate enterprise, they don't know the difference between energy and technology. They think that they're the same. They think they're interchangeable. You know, this is, a form, this is something that I call techno-grandiosity, and it's a very dangerous state of mind, and it permeates our society now. And we've got to pay close attention to that and not go down that path. We've got to be very hard-headed and realistic about what technology can and cannot do for us. And, um, you know, for example, <laughs> good luck. You know, these things are either going to run <clears throat> on what they're designed to run on, liquid hydrocarbon fuels, or we're not going to have an airline industry. And the likelihood is we're not going to have an airline industry as we know it, probably in pretty short order. That's one of the things I, uh, I, I would actually just outright, flat out predict, that the airline industry as we know it today will not exist in five years. You know, you will not be going flying off to see your grandma in Louisville uh, the way you've been used to doing it. Um, you know, th there, may, there, may act, there may be uh, airlines, you know, they, they may be charters, they may be for very wealthy people. But it's going to be a different scene. It's not going to be mass transportation the way it is now. And I think it will be incrementally smaller every year after a certain point. Uh, and probably the overweening idea for all of this is the idea that there's some 
mythical they who are going to come up with a set of rescue remedies so that we can continue living exactly the way we're living. Okay, so that's not going to happen. It really isn't going to happen. And we've got to get serious about what's going on and think about what we're going to do. And um, the key to all this is going to be downscaling and relocalizing. Thomas Friedman did not have it right. He got it wrong. The global economy is not a permanent feature of the human condition. It was a set of tra transient economic relations that arose at a certain time and place in history for certain special conditions, namely uh, a half century of abundant, really cheap energy and a half century of relative peace between the great powers. Okay? I think it's very important to make a distinction between so-called solutions and intelligent responses to what we face because a lot of the solutions are not solutions to anything except propping up business as, as usual, which ain't going to happen. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to continue doing the stuff we're doing. So typically, you know, a solution that is proposed is to, a, a solution to the problem of, of oil and gasoline getting more expensive, et cetera, et cetera, is electric cars, okay? Forget about it. That ain't going to happen for a lot of reasons. You know, one of them will be the capitals disappearing, um, and plenty of other reasons. And, and I see examples of this that are just as appalling as what I saw at Google. Um, I've been to the Aspen Environmental uh, Forum meeting every uh, year for the last few years. And the only conversation, this is, by the way, where the elite cream of the cream of the environmental movement goes to talk among themselves. You know, I went there as a journalist. But uh, it's amazing to see in, in a place like Aspen that the cream of the environmental movement, all they want to talk about is, are all the new, uh, nifty new ways that we can run the cars. You know? It's totally delusional because we're not going to be able to keep happy motoring going the way it has been designed as a mass phenomenon. We're going to have to do something different. But they don't even want to talk about the, the, the really intelligent responses. They don't want to talk about walkable communities. Okay? That would be an intelligent response to what we're going through now. And we hear very little of that from the environmental movement. The only people who talk about it at all are the new urbanists, as a matter of fact, who I've been affiliated with. And you can state categorically that you know, there, there are whole sets of intelligent responses to the things that, uh, the problems that we face. They're not necessarily solutions in the sense that they, they do not at all guarantee the continuation of what we know now as being normal. But they do present opportunities for us to change and make transitions into new ways of doing things. For example, uh, we're going to have to grow food differently. We're going to have to farm differently. You know, as I said, it will probably require more human attention, it may require more animal power. We don't know whether that'll be 22% more or 2% more or 62% more. We don't know yet, you know. But we do know the farms are going to have to be smaller. They're going to require more labor, human labor, because there's going to be less diesel fuel. Uh, uh, and we're going to have to do it more locally. So we have no idea how that's going to shake out, but it's a huge set of tasks that we have to figure out. Okay? We're going to have to do commerce differently. We're going to have to rebuild local networks of economic interdependency. We're going to have to do schooling di differently because the centralized school districts are going to fail for a number of reasons. We're going to have to make things in America again because we're not going to be able to import plastic salad shooters and everything else from, sh from China forever. And in fact, there's every indication that our trade relations with China are becoming uh, difficult and, and challenged. Um, by the friction that is now running through the geopolitical system because of the contest for the remaining resources in the world and because of the stresses induced by population overshoot, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, we're going to have to inhabit the terrain of North America differently. And we're very fortunate, actually, that the new urbanists have been around for the last 20 years because um, the great achievement of the new urbanists was not building whole new towns uh, on green fields like uh, uh, Seaside, Florida, or Celebration, or, or Kentlands in, in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, these new traditional neighborhood developments. Some of them were excellent. They were wonderful sort of transitional projects. But the real achievement of the new urbanists was not that. 
Their great achievement was they, they dove into the dumpster of history and they retrieved a lot of information and principle and technique and methodology and skill for how to design and assemble places that are worth living in that have a future. Not places that have no future, not infrastructures for daily life that we can't depend on, you know, five years from now, but places that really do have some prospect of continuing, of enduring. And uh, one of the things that, that they did was to instruct, to inform us that if we just looked around at the good stuff that was already there from our history, and if we reconnected our future to our past and overcame that huge discontinuity of suburbia that we could produce places that would be uh, wonderful to dwell in and that would have a future. Um, I've said enough about this already. A huge problem. The, I don't like to use a lot of charts because I think that uh, um, there's a danger of using statistical analysis to just lie. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's, it can be a very slippery tool for understanding reality. But this one is just so uh, overwhelming. You know, the number of square feet of retail per person in America. We don't need a single additional souvenir spoon shop in America. We're done. So, you know, I mean, in case you discover uh, six months from now that we're in the middle of a hellacious commercial real estate implosion, that's one of the reasons. We don't need any more of this stuff. We're way overbuilt for selling stuff. Uh, and it's not in the right places, and it's not in the right size boxes. It's not doesn't come in the right form. So we're going to have to rebuild these local networks of economic interdependency, in which people played more than one role in their in their town, in their community. They you know they play an economic role, but they also have a social role. And it's sometimes not easy to see where one leaves off and the other one takes up. Okay, because to some extent you're employing people you know. And to some extent, when you employ people, you know you become, you have to become more responsible one way or another. You may not be good at it, but there's an obligation there to do it. And there are penalties that you pay if you fail to do it correctly uh, in, the, in, in terms of your status in the community and your ability to continue doing what you're doing. So we have to rebuild these local networks. The, you know, the main streets and the business districts in our towns and cities are waiting to be reactivated, and they will be. Um, and, of course, there will be a lot of wealth lost in the implosion of all the suburban crap that we built. We're going to have to make things again. We have no idea how we're going to do this. We will probably have fewer things to buy. We're not, you know, uh, retail and commerce and shopping is going to move more into the background of everyday life than it has been for us, in which shopping has been constantly in our face all the time. But... Um, it, my guess is that making things in the USA will happen on a much smaller scale. It's not even, you know, history is not symmetrical. We're not going back to 1923. Um, we're probably going to have to do it on a much more modest basis because we're going to be on the energy downside of the arc rather than the upside of the arc. And my guess is that ma manufacturing may be dependent on our ability to, to uh, generate local water power uh, and electricity locally. So the places that have the ability to do that are going to be the places that may have prospects for being successful. Schooling. Well, you know, they're failing on so many levels. They're failing uh, uh, in terms of being too big. You know, the kids don't know everybody in the school and the instructors don't know them. And, and you know, we made a very bad bargain. Uh, we decided that we'd save on administrative costs by consolidating all the schools, and we en ended up building institutions that uh, are, are places that uh, make people feel bad, especially, uh, obviously, the children. You know, we, they're, they're, it's even expressed in the building forms that we put up, like the Hannibal Lecter Central School in Las Vegas, you know, a building designed like a maximum security prison. And, and that's... Such a terrible thing. It's such a tragedy because it sends a message to kids that school's punishment, not that it's a rewarding, privileged experience, a privileged activity to get the transmission of 5,000 years of human culture. You're being punished instead by being made to go to this awful place where you don't, they don't even furnish a window to look out of because there's a chance that you're going to slip out the window and snatch a motorist off the street and eat his liver. <laughs> but, of course, the yellow school bus umbilical cord that connects the school to all its customers is going to fail too. We know that. 
This is the great tragedy right now in the making that um, we're not rebuilding the passenger railroad system in America. New York is one of the few places in the United States where you actually have some sense that there is public transit available and that, people, that it has a normative kind of character to it. It's not just for poor people and retards and, and losers, okay? But in most of America, it doesn't exist like this. And it's, it's terribly important that we rebuild the passenger railroad road system in America. And by the way, the idea that we're going to build a high-speed rail network, forget about it. We're not going to do that. We don't have the money. The capital is gone. That capital went out the window with Goldman Sachs and AIG and Freddie and Fannie and everything else. The money is gone. We don't have, we cannot build a parallel set of railroad tracks with different curve ratios and grades for an entirely new railroad system. We got to rebuild the existing railroad system. And the system we have now would make the Bulgarians ashamed. Okay? And it's terribly important because it would put scores of thousands of people to work. It would benefit people in all ranks of society. And the fact that we're not even talking about it shows that we're not a serious people. We're not a serious society or a serious nation. We've got to do this thing. It's additionally important because we need a project that we can do collectively that is actually accomplishable that we can demonstrate to ourselves that we have some capacity to solve some problem, okay? Because everything else we're failing to do correctly, you know? We're really failing to reform health care, really. You know, we're failing to reform finance. We're not really, we're doing nothing about, we're making no provision for transportation. And so we've got to do this, just to demonstrate that we're capable, competent people living in a competent society. The, the demise of, of happy motoring is poorly understood, too. And I think, you know, there are new elements of, of, of the story that are coming into the picture just, you know, in the last 12 months. One of them is that because of the crisis of capital, there's far fewer uh, loans available for people to buy cars. And buying cars on installment loans is the normal way that people acquire the hardware for motoring in America and has been normal for over half a century. Okay? And increasingly, it's more and more difficult to do that. So that's one thing that's changed. Another thing that's changed is our car companies are bankrupt. You know, we can't even produce them locally uh, in, in North America anymore successfully. So we are now really at the mercy of other countries, even though we're trying to revive our industry. You know, the, the, the chances are that it's not going to work out too well anyway. And there's yet another factor has entered the picture that nobody's really taking into account. We're broke. Our counties are broke. Our municipalities are broke. And the federal government is broke. And we're not going to be able to fix the incredibly elaborate roadway system in America, this hierarchy of roads that goes from the smallest little county roads and, and municipal streets to the interstate highway system and everything in between. It's become this enormous system that requires enormous amounts of investment every year. It ha and these, these roads have got to be kept in immaculate condition because if they're not, they deteriorate extra special quickly. So that's another thing. We're going to see all these things converge in a way that will make motoring less and less of a mass democratic experience. And that it in itself will entail new political problems in the sense that motoring will become less and less democratic and there will be a new um, reason for people to generate grievance and resentment over the loss of their entitlement to motoring. So look for that as yet another irritation in the, in the body politic and the teabagger movement. You won't, you know, it will not really appear in the teabagger movement as like a visible, audible thing. People won't talk about it much, but this stuff's going to be in the background. Okay, because a lot of people are going to be suffering from being stuck in places with lousy cars that are falling apart that they can't afford to replace or fix, driving on roads that are going to become increasingly broken that will break their axles and destroy their front ends and, and make their, their shitty cars even worse. So we got to move stuff by other means than trucks, and we're not prepared for this at all. One example, we're going to have to... Um, uh, 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 restore m the infrastructure for maritime trade in this country, not just in our harbors uh, on the oceans, and of course 
that part of that will be determined by the outcome of climate change or not climate change. We don't know yet. But that's good. that'll be a problem for the harbors. But also our inland waterways have to be reactivated. All over America, we're doing nothing but building condominiums and festival marketplaces and band shells where the wharves and piers used to be. We've got to put those back. We've got to put the piers back and the wharves and warehouses back and even the sleazy accommodations for the people who work on the boats. And we're not even thinking about that. It's not even on the radar screen. This uh, long emergency is going to produce a lot of economic losers, and they're going to be really pissed off, and they're going to express their pissed offness, and they already are. You know, the teabag movement is the first iteration of this discontent and grievance, and it has uh, the potential for getting very, very ugly. You know, uh, uh, for eight years, my, you know, I, I'm basically, I'm a, re a sort of centrist registered Democrat Obama voter. Um, and a lot of my friends are likewise, you know, old boomer, yuppie, liberal, progressive types, you know. But they spent the last eight years wringing their hands over George Bush, you know, oh, he's like Stalin, terrible person, you know. You know, I, I don't, you know George Bush was not the problem. The, the problem is going to be that when the United States, when the public, the American public, um, experiences such economic distress and greets it with paralysis and immobility and a lack of coherent thought and a lack of plan and a lack of any idea of what they're doing and childish beliefs, you know, what will happen is they'll get so desperate that they will beg somebody to push them around. And that's what you got to worry about. And that's what the Glenn Becks and Rush Limbaugh's represent. You know, they are the wished-for bully who will push around America and make shit happen. And that's, those are the, the things that I worry about, that I lose sleep over. We've got to decomplexify. It is a terrible, daunting task. We've got to take all these systems that are used to operating a certain way, and we've got to make them better, finer, smaller, more local. And the way this is sorted out politically often is by civil war, uh, social uh, uh, upheaval, unrest, political disorder. We don't want that to happen in the United States. A lot of it may occur around the issue of agriculture because when you start getting into, you know, revolution frequently does. In fact, there are a few real revolutions in, in this world, in history, that didn't have a major component of uh, uh, the redistribution of property, okay? And what will happen is, as other things lose value in our everyday world, especially abstract assets, you know, paper certificates, stocks, credit default swaps, whatever, you know, it, it will be recognized that people who have wealth in good productive land really have something. And we will also have a large number of people who are un unemployed and underemployed, and in some cases maybe even hungry. And I think what you're going to see is a whole new level of struggle over and conflict over who gets to own the good land in America, okay? And that is going to lead to, we don't know what the social relations are going to be between people who have this land and the people who expected to spend the rest of their life doing, you know, office work uh, or, or being a, a marketing manager for, the, for a chain retail you know, and all of a sudden they realize, oh, shit, I'm, now I'm working in agriculture. I'm 27 years old, and I went to college. I got a degree in public relations, and I'm working in agriculture. I'm pissed off about it, and I'm pissed off that this guy owns the farm that I'm working on. Why should he get to own it? And maybe I can find 100 people who don't like that too much, and we can just go take it away from them. That's the kind of thing that happens historically. I want to talk about cities for a while. I want to talk about the whole issue of where we live. Uh, I love these, uh, these uh, illustrations of the future from yesterday because they always get at least one major thing hugely wrong, usually more than one thing. Th this one's from about 1957, and it, 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 it puts across the idea that the future will be all about driving Edsels because that's what they thought in 1957. The future was all going to be about being in an Edsel in the 21st century. Uh, and, and we do face very, very... Um, significant demographic shifts in the years ahead probably is not going to work out the way people imagine. A lot of people, for example, make the simplistic leap that because the suburbs are going to fail, both 
as monetary investments and in utilitarian terms, that therefore everybody will move to the cities. But that's not true. Our cities are overbuilt. Our cities are overscaled. Our cities are not scaled to the energy realities of the future. And in one way or another, probably multiple ways, they are going to get into trouble. And, and um, they are going to sub substantially contract. And the fortunate ones will contract around their old cores and their waterfronts. And the process, in any event, is probably going to be messy and disorderly and fraught with conflict as it occurs. Um, I think the action is much more likely to be in the places that are now derelict in America, the small cities, especially the places that are on uh, inland waterways, especially the places that are scaled to the energy realities of the future, okay? Uh, this one happens to be Troy, New York. You know, if you're interested, incredible real estate opportunities even now there. Almost every building in the picture is under-activated and in some cases vacant, and they're one, the just tremendous infrastructure in the town waiting to be fixed and reactivated. Um, <clears throat> I don't have to say too much more about farming, but except this, that there is also a, a, a huge uh, opportunity to be understood in the relationship between where people live and the relationship with productive land. Because the places that are going to be successful are the places that have a meaningful relationship with productive land in one way or another. Places uh, that the action won't be, like Las Vegas, uh, the, the, um, uh, the adventure will be over, the excitement will be over for everyone but the tarantulas. Do you have relatives who are planning to move to Phoenix or Tucson? Tell them not to do it. Forget about it. The, those places are not going to make it. They're toast. Uh, they're going to dry up and blow away. They're going to have problems with water and food on top of the problems that they have with an incredibly punishing climate, which requires everybody from the lowliest landscaping gardener employee to the richest person in town to have air conditioning. You can't just have it for the rich people. It's got to be for everybody in these places, or they will not function. And we're going to have problems with the electric grid. We're going to forget about these places. They are going to contract hugely. Another thing we don't understand, skyscrapers, a building type that is purely a product of the cheap energy era, namely the last 100 years. We, the places that are overburdened with skyscrapers are going to be overburdened with huge liabilities. These things will not be assets, they're liabilities. And not even for some of the reasons that are obvious, like the problems they face with energy resources for heating them and running them, electricity, natural gas, etc. The actual hidden problem is these buildings will never be renovated. They'll never be renovated. We won't have the capital to renovate them, and we probably won't have the modular, fabricated building materials made of, of exotic metals and plastics to fix them. And uh, I saw the preview of coming attractions for this in Johannesburg a year ago, um, where the, the entire business district was abandoned when apartheid ended, and all of white corporate South Africa moved to suburban fortifications north of the downtown. And the entire downtown, which is the size and scale of Denver, roughly, about 30 blocks of skyscrapers with maybe 27 towers in it, you know, had all become residential slums. They didn't renovate the buildings or anything. They just, they just had people living in offices with one bathroom for, per floor, right? And people hanging their, their laundry out the 27th floor. And one by one, the buildings are getting beat up and useless, and they're being deactivated, and they put concertina wire around the base so the squatters can't move in anymore. And that's the destiny of these buildings. So, you know, Manhattan is a wonderful place. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you very much, George Gershwin, George Steinbrenner, Michael Bloomberg. You know, it's been a grand, in Donald Trump, it's been a grand adventure. But it's now, from now on, it's going to be a huge problem. And I had kind of a you know, one of those kind of uh, aha moments myself. A, a few months ago, I was walking across Central Park from uh, Broadway to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I real, you know, I grew up in Manhattan on 68th Street, although I haven't lived there for three decades. And um, I, I realized that the city has never been in as good condition in my lifetime as it is right now, okay? But from now on, it starts to face terrible problems of the type I've described. We don't know what the, the urban scale is finally going to be. Probably 
seven stories and under. It'll probably have to be much shorter. And, you know, New York's not prepared for this, so it's hard to say what the destiny of New York is going to be. I think it's going to be probably a very difficult transition for New York City. It'll also be difficult for Houston and Dallas and Atlanta. Uh, you know, other places it's hard to say. Some, of, some places in America have already, they're well into the various cycles. You know, Detroit is well into the depopulation cycle. Um, Baltimore is in an interesting cycle where it, it's actually been substantially depopulated in, in the places where it's likely to happen, anything a half a mile from the center. Meanwhile, some of the great neighborhoods at the center and the waterfront are indeed coming back very strongly. So it's a strange and interesting case. All, you know, all the best stuff that's coming back is under seven stories. And, you know, when you go to Europe, you don't see that discontinuity that we had in the USA. This is a new project in Europe, and it's virtually indistinguishable from the urban fabric of everything else in the old European cities, because it's exactly the same scale and typology that you get in, in uh, the uh, traditional European city. So they, you know, they did not go through the trauma of suburbanization and disinvestment in the urban uh, place and for the most part they didn't go through the hypertrophy of the skyscraper city. They do have skyscrapers but not anything like the United States. Uh, we, will, we are probably going to see a revival of the public realm because as the automobile becomes a decreasing presence in our lives, uh, the, the, uh, the public realm of America is going to become more important again. And that's the place that is uh, the, the um, it has two basic roles in our lives. The public realm is the physical manifestation of the public interest and the common good, and it's also the physical dwelling place of our uh, civic life. And if you dishonor the public realm by turning it into a universal car slum, you're going to dishonor public life, which is exactly what we've done, and one of the reasons that American cities are so deeply unpleasant. Uh, what we've succeeded in doing in America is creating, you know, 38,000 places that are not worth caring about. All the, this, is, this happens to be the mall, great mall intersection in my town, uh, one mile north of the Saratoga Springs Business District, okay? And uh, when we have enough of these places that aren't worth caring about, we'll have a country that's not worth uh, uh, carrying on. We'll have a civilization that's not worth carrying forward. We'll have a land that's not worth defending. So these things have really rather deep implications for us. We can't afford to be like this anymore. And this is especially true for men in the room, okay? We can no longer, men can no longer afford to present themselves to each other and to themselves and to the world as clowns. We now have to reach a point where we have to stop being a clown culture and be grown-ups and even appear to be, we have to appear to have some decorum in our daily life. A lot of people, you know, uh, for a lot of people, the presidential campaign was about hope. Um, but I, I think there was a, a misunderstanding that hope is not given to you by outside forces. You actually have to generate the hope yourself by demonstrating that you're a competent, uh, intelligent person capable of responding to the signals that reality sends you and doing it, uh, doing it in a way that allows your community and your, your culture to, to go forward. So we have a great deal to get serious about, a big to-do list of things that we have to do. We don't have time to be crybabies. We don't have time for quixotic, ridiculous campaigns that are unrealistic. We don't have time for techno-triumphalism or techno-grandiosity. We got to get real, really fast about what we can do and what's really possible in this country. And this is an advertisement for me. I wrote a book called The Long Emergency, a nonfiction book about the global energy predicament and its implications for American life. And after that, I wrote a novel set in upstate New York, where I live, uh, in the post-oil American future called World Made by Hand. That was published in 2008 by the Atlantic Monthly Press. Uh, I recently finished the sequel, The Witch of Hebron, coming out in September. Um, and I'm going to leave this on the screen. Uh, I'm going to stay here for questions, and um, anybody who doesn't want to stick around, you're welcome to leave. I won't be offended, but let's just make the process as quick as possible. So if you want to stick around and, and chat, that's fine. If you want to leave, go on to your next thing. And Aaron, can you get me a Diet Coke with some ice from up here? And we'll start right away with questions.
if you want to just get right into that. I believe this is one of the things that statistical analysis will not avail you to understand, and it's one of the reasons that I don't like statistical analysis. I think it's more a matter of what is the consensus in our culture about what that means. And it changes from being a fairly firm thing at a certain point in time, like let's say 1964, to becoming an extremely squishy thing later on. Uh, and, and now as we're losing it, it's kind of firming up again because the people who are losing ground so desperately are aware that they're losing social status and economic status. It's becoming much more vivid for them. And so I think what we're seeing, one of the few things that we're seeing happen is, thank you very much, the, you know, one of the few parts of a consensus that we're seeing is a firming up of, of really what does it mean to be middle class? And what it means is to be able to pay your obligations, to feed your family, to feel okay about yourself as an adult, that you can make a living, to have chosen a, uh, an endeavor, a, a vocation that has a future, you know? And these are the things that are going to define that. It's going to be a smaller class of people, and there's going to be a much larger class of angry former middle class people. So it's a consensus issue, not a statistical measuring. One of the things that I, wanna, I would impress on any audience is this idea, and it's part of the techno-triumphalism problem. We have developed the idea in this country that just because you can measure something, you can control it. And that's behind a lot of the statistic, statistical bullshit that we are drowning in every single day. You know, that especially from the news media who regards this stuff as being, you know, having uh, value as truth. And in fact, you know, I had a father-in-law, uh, actually, who was a, uh, an IBM senior scientist and uh, Harvard overseer and member, a board member of the National Science Foundation. And his favorite book was called How to Lie with Statistics. Anybody else? Yeah, the new urbanists, a poorly understood phenomenon. The new urbanists were a group of architectural and development reformers who came along in the late 1980s for the first time. They were young people, boomers, who had gone through the energy crisis of the 70s and had a kind of epiphany that they, they realized it wasn't just about building, you know, passive solar houses and using... Uh, photovoltaic cells and stuff like that. It was much more about building neighborhoods and communities that, that had a, a, a structure that had a future um, and that were walkable communities. And so they, they formed this association and they had a clear sense of mission, which was to reform the way we did d development in America, which you know 99.99% .99 of it was conventional suburban development. You put up a subdivision, you put up a strip mall, you put up a box store, and that's what you do, okay? That was clearly killing America. It was an environmental problem, a political problem, an economic problem, a social problem. And the new urbanists came along and said, we have got to reform the way we inhabit the landscape in America. And they became a very potent movement in the development world for the last 20 years. Um, and, you know, I said enough about what, you know, what they did was that they went back and they, they started to repair the discontinuity in American life where we had gotten rid of traditional modes of living in neighborhoods, cities, uh, villages, uh, real urban places at all levels of hierarchy because these are hierarchical things. A village is one neighborhood, a town is several neighborhoods in a small business district, a city is many neighborhoods in many business districts. Okay, and they understood what the composition and design and assembly of the urban place was, and that it was a distinct place apart from the rural place. 
the farm, the, the wilderness. You know, there are different typologies of rural places too, just like there are different urban typologies. And so they got all this information clear and they began to do a lot of good work. And in fact, they did reform a lot of practices. They went into a lot of towns and rewrote the codes, which tended to mandate a suburban outcome. You know, most of the laws in American zoning and planning mandate suburban sprawl because they say you must supply 11 parking places for every 1,000 square feet of whatever you built, blah, 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 blah. It's right there in the codes. You, you, you can't do it otherwise. So they went into these places and they said, look, this is ridiculous. We're entering a different future. We've got to do this stuff differently. And they learned how to not just do the codes right, but to go through the very agonizing, difficult political process of, uh, of ref getting a group of stakeholders together to make it happen legislatively. So it's been a very, very important movement. And it's not, a, the one thing it's not about is the thing that you expressed. It's not about confusing what's urban and what's rural. In fact, it's, it's about rediscovering what the distinctions are between these things and putting these things in the right place. Do, do you understand? Greenhouses. We, we may not be able to feed every, first of all, we don't know how much stuff we're going to have to grow locally. We don't know whether we're going to have to grow 20% of our food or 80% of our food. We don't know. We don't know how things are going to be moving around the United States. The United States is a large continental-sized nation with huge transportation challenges because of the, the mistakes that we've made in the last 30 years in not preparing ourselves. But um, that, that's really an issue apart, how are we going to grow our food. Their concern is not so much what the techniques for farming are going to be, because they are not agronomists. Their, their main interest is what is the urban form going to be and how, it is, how is it going to exist in meaningful relationship to the places where the agriculture takes place. And that's the most important thing. Uh, and, you know, it really suggests a return to traditional relationships where basically you have urban places and then they are served by an agricultural hinterland. This is how human society worked for five, ten thousand years. Uh, it's only been in the last 50 years that we became completely confused about this because suburbia destroyed the distinction between what's urban and what's rural. It turned it into a big mishmash. So many of the people alive in America today can't even think about it clearly. I mean, they don't even know, they can't look at a landscape and read the landscape and say, what is that I'm seeing? I mean, one of the things we know about suburbia, because this is the primary way that people respond to it, is that it's visually incoherent. You know, they register that as ugliness. Suburbia is ugly. But it's not just ugly, it is, it is illegible. We can't even tell what it does or what it's supposed to do or what it's telling us. And one of the virtues of the new urbanists is that they have a very clear set of methods and principles for reestablishing where stuff happens and what it's saying to us and how we know what to use the land for. And, and one, of the, one of the, in the big Santa Claus bag of delusions that America is now burdened by is this idea that we're going to do things like urban farming in skyscrapers. You know, there's a lot of bullshit out there about vertical farming. You know, we're not going to do that. It's nonsense. You know, it's a complete misunderstanding of, the, of, of, uh, of how the world works uh, and how the earth works. And uh, uh, it's really a matter of how are we going to reactivate the places that where we traditionally we grow stuff outside the cities. It doesn't mean that you won't have gardens in the city. You know, gardens are typologically one kind of green space that you have in cities, and there are many forms of them. You know, there are communal gardens, there are rose gardens, there are Italian water gardens, there are ball fields, there are 
uh, urban squares and plazas. And again, these are typological things. And one of the, you know, one of the great virtues of the new urbanists is that they organized all this information in such a coherent way. They were so, they were so. Uh, um, uh, it was so important to them to make it coherent. So if you, if you actually look at their books and look at their code books, like the Smart Code Book or, or uh, uh, Andres Duany's uh, uh, Suburban Nation book, you know, it's very clearly presented in a way that cuts through the residue of extreme confusion left over from suburbia. There are things we can say about it. I think that uh, well, there are observations we can make, but I don't know that they're conclusive, especially at this point. A couple of things. Yes, France uh, made the decision to produce a lot of nuclear-generated uh, electricity. Uh, so far for them, it has been a, a good decision. It has worked out real well for them um, in lots of ways. One was that they had a uniform reactor design so that all the reactors are the same. Whereas in the United States, we have to reinvent the reactor every time, and we, you know, and they all fail in different ways. Their stuff, at least, they understand their shit, um, and they can run a lot of stuff, you know, cleanly, like the train system. But they also they got that up and running 30 years ago. They got the high-speed rail running in the 70s. Um, another thing about Europe, they never threw away the idea that city life had value. Uh, in you know most places in America, except for New York City and San Francisco and Chicago and Washington, and maybe Boston and Savannah, you know, the idea that city life has value has been lost. There's no value for city life in Kansas City or Indianapolis or or, or St. Louis, you know, or very little, very little. You know, it's very low, and. Um, uh, but they, they never lost that in Europe. In fact, it's highly valued. And even at every scale of the hierarchy of urbanism, you know, whether it's the small city, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, like Avignon, or a medium-sized city like Lyon, or a big city like Paris, the wealthy inhabit the center of town. You know, that's the pattern there, because it's desirable to be at the center of town. Because city life is rewarding in these places. It's punishing in America. It's totally different. And uh, they also, unlike us, they maintained the idea that public transit had value throughout the 20th century. So they never had that discontinuity where they allowed their train system to fall completely to shit, nor did they lose the, you know, the, the, the hierarchical parts of it, like the streetcars and trams and things that were connected that allowed you to really get from point A to point B totally without some interruption. You know, where, you know, in, in Switzerland, you can go from your house, from the tram to the train to the center of the city to the airport, you know. In New York, you go from your home. How do you get to the airport in America? I, I mean, fl just flying into uh, Kennedy Airport is just such a horror. You know, you, 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 you know, you come from Amsterdam where you've taken a train right to the terminal and you go to JFK and you're in this slum airport, you know, that's so poorly served by transit. And the transit that they do have is this dark satanic journey, you know, through Jamaica. It's disgraceful. But so they didn't lose those things. Now, you know, on, on the minus side, there are some problems that they have. One is that, that uh, you know, historically, you know, they're made up ethnically of many, many, many different language groups and ethnic groups and people who historically c conflict with each other. They've been through an extraordinary 60-year period of relative peace. I mean, this is after, you know, the first half of the 20th century absolutely kicking the shit out of each other and almost leveling the continent, right? So. You know, the new normal for the last 60 years has been Europe is a wonderful, peaceful, storybook land of lovely towns and cities and neighborhoods. 
you know. But, uh, you know, one, I think that they're in for all kinds of uh, disruptions, and they're just beginning with finance and, and the euro and sovereign debt default and problems with the money system. And they're going to spread into other areas, including the immigration problem. And, uh, uh, you know, God knows what will happen. Uh, you know, another thing with them is they're very, very poorly supplied with energy resources. And they've been kicking back for the last 10, 15 years, letting America do their dirty work in the Middle East. Okay, while they benefit from being able to still have all the oil they want coming up through the Suez Canal and everything's cool, you know. But these are, and we think of these countries as being, you know, senile, sclerotic countries full of cafe layabouts who don't do anything. But they're very capable of, of uh, militarizing and getting nasty with each other or militarizing and protecting their interests uh, aggressively. We haven't begun to see that yet, you know? Uh, but I think that we will, because I, in the next 20 years, we're going to see a contest between the great powers of the world over the re remaining dwindling energy resources. And Europe is going to be in there fighting for their share, along with North America and China and Japan and the Middle East people in their way and Russia and India. You know, we're all going to be in that battle together, and we, we don't know how it's going to sort out. I wrote in the long emergency that what would characterize the period ahead, most likely, you know, my scenario, because I, I admit that other people have, you know, other views on this and other scenarios, but my scenario is that uh, and, you know, I wrote that in 2005, that the federal government would become increasingly ineffectual and impotent and unable to address these problems and all of their spin-offs. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing, is that, you know, the federal government, we have paralysis at, at the federal level, and we also have it at the state level, where we have increasing insolvency and bankruptcy and inability to solve any problems from education to transportation. And um, I think that, you know, the ultimate direction of that is that power moves downward so that eventually the, the real governance is going to be located at a much more local level. And I don't know whether that means the federal government, you know, withers away or is still there in some vestigial form or has pretensions to power that aren't real, that they don't really have, because that's sort of what seems to be going on now. Um, but that's, that's what I see happening. So I, I don't see necessarily the, the likelihood, uh, even if, you know, Glenn Beck was elected tomorrow, I, I think the prospect would be that he would be uh, heading a, an increasingly ineffectual government. So he'd be like a feckless fascist if he got elected. Uh, what do I think about new programs in light of the problems, the financial problems uh, of uh, the new health care thing? I think that we have probably not solved anything really with the health care reform, that um, the, our society is in a race to, uh, to outrun the destruction of capital and, and the, and the very, very rapid loss of wealth that we thought we had to do things. And um, my guess is that the outcome of a lot of these things will be um, counterintuitive and unexpected. For example, in healthcare, you know, I think that the system will become so unworkable and unwieldy that essentially you'll be making private contracts with people who have medical competence to take care of you for cash, one way or another. That that's the final disposition of things. And I don't know how many years ahead that is, but that's my guess. Um, likewise, I think, you know, this, I think that the, the public schools are gonna fail, but we're not, and, and they'll fail partly because of the logistics, because we've centralized them and now we can't really decentralize them. We're, now that we've 
con uh, we, we've uh, aggregated them and consolidated them, we're unlikely to successfully deconsolidate them and you know, build new small schools and distribute them equitably around the places where people live so that they function better. You know, it's what's more likely to happen is that you'll get homeschooling that'll become more and more normal and, and will be semi-professionalized and will aggregate into somewhat larger neighborhood groups. And then the kids will be lucky to get kind of uh, the equivalent of an eighth grade education from there. You know, uh, I think you're going to see a similar thing in the university system. The university system probably won't survive the, the, the implosion of capital ahead. You know, how are you going to run the University of Iowa, you know, without the immense amounts of uh, uh, revenue from, you know, in the state coffers? Uh, or, or revolving debt. How are you going to run, you know, a big state university that has 40,000 students without revolving debt, without all of the, the uh, you know, the, the, the mechanisms of big business that are not going to be working too well? Uh, uh, I think what you're going to see is that they're going to incrementally fail. They're going to, they're going to shrink. They're going to contract. They're going to lop off pieces of themselves bit by bit, you know, until, and many of them will disappear. I think they're a very confused group well, at the moment. Well, I mean, but what I'm wondering about is, do you see some sort of movement that maybe mimics, takes some of the libertarian or, you know, individualized version of the party system and then tries to make it more of I'm looking for that. I'm desperately looking for a body of thinking among supposedly progressive people who would be a, a counterpart to the teabaggers but would represent a progressive form of it and not this retrograde, you know, sort of crypto-racist, uh, nativist, um, confused, militaristic, hyper-patriotic, you know, empire-building bag of nuts. And I don't see him. I think it's one of the great disappointments of, uh, of the years right now that we're living in that these this kind of leadership is not there. It does not seem to emerge. You know, there was great hope, uh, I think, that Obama would represent a figure of that sort who would in turn represent a body of people of that kind. And he's been just hugely disappointing. Um, you know, he hasn't stood up to the banks. Um, you know, even some of the practical stuff that I'm talking about, you know, he, he spent... Um, Scores of billions of dollars on new highway projects just because they had, you know, gotten their approvals already, uh, uh, rather than investing in real public transit that it could really work, you know, accomplish something in their lives and made money and have positions of authority in this country. You know, we, what we're seeing is a really broad, comprehensive failure of authority. In everything. It's not just in politics. A lot of people think, oh, it's just politics. But it's not. It's in business, too. You know, the people who, the people who have dropped all the standards and norms and ethics of doing business responsibly in America. Um, it's in academia. You know, I run into it constantly because uh, I, I talk a lot at uh, schools of architecture, you know, where, you know, the, the, the mandarins who run these places are interested only in the narcissism du jour. They're not interested in, in, uh, in places that really have a future. They're interested in stunts, in architectural stunts. Um, so there's a failure there, there's a failure in, uh, in the media. You know, the New York Times has done an abysmal job of co covering the energy crisis uh, and in articulating our real position and, and making it clear what we, the losses that we face if we don't do something. Um, and, you know, if you, and, you know, and then, you know, there's the, just that example that I, 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 it made such an impression on me, the Aspen Environmental Institute. If these people can't do the thinking of your society, if they can't articulate uh, the, uh, a consensus that make, that, that is coherent, 
then who do you depend on? You know, the people at NASCAR? The Glenn Beck watchers? You know, who is going to be, bring you a consensus? That, and of course, I come out of a generation historically which was pretty good at forming some consensuses for things. Like, you know, for, for the yuppies uh, among us, so or the boomers, you know, we remember the social justice movement. We remember when it was very important to get behind the idea of uh, finishing the unfinished business of the Civil War in the 1960s. Uh, legally, and, and, and the rightness of it was ineluctable. Nobody in their right mind could get on the wrong side of that debate. And we had a pretty clear consensus, and we actually acted. Uh, and we changed the laws. But you, that's gone, you know, and, and what's replaced it is the most disgusting Goldman Sachs boomer uh, uh, narcissism and greed and disregard for the public interest that is stupefying. I, I wonder where are the people in the public uh, uh, law offices, in the attorney general's offices around the, the country and in Washington? What on God's green earth is Eric Holder doing in his office? Why is not one investigation emanated from his office into the misdeeds of Wall Street? It's un inexplicable, you know? Why has Andrew Cuomo not brought one prosecution uh, in all the frauds and swindles that emanated out of his jurisdiction in Wall Street? You know, you can't account for these failures. A and to some extent, they're not even articulated. I mean, almost no one's um, twanging on Andrew Cuomo right now. In fact, everybody's just waiting for him to announce he's going to run for governor. Oh, boy, oh, boy. But I'm thinking, you know, Andrew Cuomo, where are you now? You know, why, why are you not doing anything about this stuff? You know, why are you allowing the kind of, even just the simple accounting fraud that's going on? I mean, forget about the outright swindles like, uh, uh, you know, the Abacus Goldman Sachs deal. I mean, just accounting fraud. You know, misreporting stuff. So... It's pretty appalling, and, and, and I, you know, to tell you the truth, I think that it's going to have to be you, uh, generation, whatever you are, Ys or Ds or Ls. What, what generation are you in your letter? You, whatever post-Gen Gen X, Gen Y, video gamer people you are, you're the ones who are going to have to be heroic. And, uh, and maybe from your ranks, you know, people will emerge in two years or five years who, who get up and say, okay, America, you've got to get your shit together, especially as regards property and the defense of property law and how these things are conducted in a way that is transparent and fair and just. And we're certainly, it's not coming from my generation. Uh, you know, the, the danger is, is that you could also become the Robespierre's of 2014. You know, be, that the situation will have gotten so disgusting that you'll be sitting on tribunals, you know, uh, voting to cut off the heads of the Lloyd Blank fines of the world. I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating it, but it happens historically. This kind of thing happens historically. You know, read about the French Revolution. A lot of lawyers involved in that. The National Assembly was full of lawyers. Anything else? Any unfinished business? Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Go forth and be brave. <laughs>